Welcome to Voice of the Vatican. Our top stories. Seven new saints. Tens of thousands gathered in St. Peter's Square as the church recognized the sainthood of heroic men and women. A model for priests. We'll take a closer look at newly canonized St. Alfonso Maria Fusco, who lived his priesthood by educating and evangelizing teens, especially the poor and abandoned. Women's Conference. International women gather in Italy to discuss their role as builders of peace, especially in the Middle East. Election Preparation. Bishops of Nicaragua call for prayer and fasting for the present and the future of their country. A solemn occasion. A concert in Rome paid tribute to what happened 73 years ago, when Roman Jews were forcefully taken from their homes to Auschwitz. New coins. The Vatican issues new collectible coins commemorating the pontificate of Pope Francis. Let the Little Ones Come, a worldwide children's rosary remembers Padre Pio's words that children's prayers can change the world. Baseball playoffs. Behind the baseball scenes, we'll speak to a priest who's hitting a spiritual home run as he shares the faith with baseball players and staff of the St. Louis Cardinals. I'm Ashley Nerona in Rome, Italy, and you're watching Voice of the Vatican only on Shalom World TV. Pope Francis canonized seven saints on October 16th with pilgrims from around the world celebrating in St. Peter's Square. The church has recognized Saints Manuel González García of Spain, Salomón Leclerc and Elizabeth of the Trinity of France, José Sánchez del Río of Mexico, Alfonso María Fusco and Ludovico Pavoni of Italy, and José Gabriel del Rosario Brochero of Argentina. Voice of the Vatican spoke to pilgrim Linda Ruff of the Archdiocese of Chicago about what it felt like to be in St. Peter's Square that day. It just struck me as the mother of six children and now adults that these are the people that should be our heroes. You know, that, that if these, there, there were men and women and they're all so brave and lived their faith in such a heroic way. And then looking around, seeing people from all over the world come to Rome together, praying and excited, and the people from Mexico, you know, viva la. So it's just so, so very uplifting, and it makes you proud to be Catholic. Father Francis Hoffman, executive director of Relevant Radio, led a pilgrimage to Rome for the canonization and spoke to Voice of the Vatican about his closeness to the saints. I was very happy uh, to be part of the canonization because I had the amazing good fortune about 10 years ago to carry the relics of Saint, the newly sainted uh, Saint Jose Sanchez de Rio from village to village in the mountains in central Mexico. So it was just a splendid day. And you look at the lives of the saints, a quite diverse group of people, the seven saints were canonized. And it all came from their inner connection with Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, through prayer. And uh, the Holy Father reflected on that. And you realize, well, anybody can pray. So potentially anyone could be a saint. So I would encourage you know, our listeners to get to know more about each saint. And they'll, the Holy Spirit will teach them uh, how they can intercede for them. But the saints, they, they're our friends in heaven. And they can intercede for us in powerful ways. We join the Universal Church in thanksgiving for these seven new intercessors and heroes of the faith. The Congregation of St. John the Baptist, which is operating in 16 countries to educate the poor, is now rejoicing for the canonization of the founder, St. Alfonso Maria Fusco. Voice of the Vatican sat down with the General Superior, Sister Rosaria Di Lorio, to find out more about this new saint called a role model for priests and religious. He lived his priesthood in a radical way in everyday life. He was very sensitive to people who were suffering, particularly children living on the streets. St. Alfonso had three loves. First, a love for the Eucharist. 
He always said he received all the graces to live his priesthood with intensity, loyalty, and joy from the love of Christ, burning like fire. So he is a model for priests who celebrate the Eucharist every day. Another love was for the Virgin Mary. He used to say that she's a mother who had already suffered so much for her son, but continues to suffer for those who stray from Jesus. His third love was for the poor, especially the young, to whom he dedicated his whole life. One of the miracles during his process of canonization happened with a young boy, a non-Christian in Zambia, who was suffering from cerebral malaria. Parasites had already invaded his whole body and bloodstream, and doctors said he wouldn't survive until the next day. A sister of our congregation was at the hospital visiting another child from one of our poor children's homes. She saw this boy in a coma and his desperate mother and told her, Madam, ask for prayers from this priest who really loved children. Pray. In the morning, the boy woke up, and doctors took a blood test to discover that the parasites were completely gone. In fact, the boy came to Rome for the canonization of St. Alfonso, along with his mother, sister, and doctor. St. Alfonso always trusted in God. Actually, he had only five lira in his pocket when he began his institute for young boys. But he remained faithful. He was generous and ready to listen and forgive, and to demonstrate fatherly love, especially in the confessional. He was a good father, the father of the poor. In the city of Bari in Puglia, Italy, the second conference of women from the Middle East and Mediterranean met this week, focusing on the theme, Women as Operators of Peace in a Culture of Dialogue. The event was co-organized by the World Association of Female Catholic Organizations. This follows a conference held in Amman in 2014 and meant to continue the reflection on women on the front lines as bridge builders of peace especially in areas of conflict like Syria and the Middle East. Delegations from Iraq, the UAE, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, Egypt, Jordan, Morocco, Syria, and 27 other countries attended. Earlier this year, a Vatican representative told the UN Security Council that women, even in the most difficult circumstances, have found a way to distinguish themselves for bravery, constancy, and dedication in the development of their nations through work in education, healthcare, and value formation. On November 6, 3.4 million Nicaraguan citizens will be called to the polls to elect the President of the Republic and 90 deputies of the National Assembly. To prepare, the Episcopal Conference of Nicaragua has called on every parish in the country to organize a day of prayer and fasting for the present and future of Nicaragua. In a joint letter, the bishops of Managua, Matagalpa and Esteli have expressed their concern for the future of democracy in Nicaragua. They state, We invite all citizens to face this electoral process decisively and to act according to one's conscience, freely and without fear of any external coercion. We call on all Nicaraguans to act peacefully, with respect for the legitimate choices of every person and to avoid anything that threatens the physical and moral integrity of others. Peace is a gift from God, but is also the fruit of justice and human commitment. October 16, 1943 is a dark day in Roman history, when German Nazis forced more than 1,000 Jewish people to leave their homes in Rome and deported them to Auschwitz. In Rome this week, an event was held at the Catholic Convent of the Sisters of St. Philip Neri to remember the solemn occasion. A Jewish choir sang liturgical songs, musicians performed, poetry was read, and testimonials given. Voice of the Vatican spoke to the event co-organizers, Dr. Tobias and Federica Walbrecher, who explained that their idea for this event was born years ago when they met three shop clerks with the last name Spitzakino. Federica recognized the name as that of the only woman survivor of that October 16, 1943 deportation. And when I went to the shop, I asked them, you, you are kind of relatives to this woman? Because we heard her uh, speak close to the synagogue years ago, and they said, yes, that's our great aunt. And so we talked to each other and, and became friends and said, we have to do something together, Jews and Christian remembering what happened there. And it came out that over the years, it's the fourth time that we did that uh, event, we uh, 
succeeded in bringing hope and consolation to the people. We already received some letters now. They said, thank you so much. You gave us hope. And uh, go on to with these wonderful meetings. Because often when, when you have meetings like that, where you remember very sad things, uh, it remains dark. It makes a, a big dark hole. And we as Catholics, as Christians, we know that out of everything which is very sad and very dark, some the, the shining of the Lord will save us and we can give this consolation. We know that the open wounds are still bleeding, even after more than 70 years. And so that's why we felt apparently the official things were not enough. Frick and I developed a little logo for the meeting. It's called Jews and Christians, Ebrei Christiani. And it shows a white rose with 12 leaflets like the 12 apostles and 12 tribes of Israel, and a little uh, yellow and a blue, whitish uh, leaflet, one for the Catholic Church and one for Israel. I think it's possible to do something as a normal person. We are not very important persons. We have no association in our back. We just acted as a married couple, Catholic couple, with three children. What can we do for the Jewish-Christian dialogue? We said, well, let, let's call a Hebrew teacher and let them teach our children Hebrew. Today they can write and read and talk Hebrew. We don't know what will this lead to, but it makes perhaps possible kind of a dialogue. As Pope Benedict XVI says, the way of dialogue is to authentically share that joy which has been given to us by Christ. Did you know that the Vatican, as a sovereign city-state, has its own currency and stamps? And this month, the Philatelic and Numismatic Office of the Vatican released five new commemorative coins, bearing the image of Pope Francis on one side as sovereign of the Vatican city-state. The other side of the coins feature images such as buildings in Vatican City, angels in the coat of arms of the Pope. A two euro coin commemorating the pontificate of Pope Francis has been released, as well as five and 10 euro silver coins and 20 and 50 euro gold coins. The Vatican has an agreement with the Italian state mint to mint up to 1 million euro per year. In 1996, looking ahead to the Jubilee year of 2000, the Vatican began minting gold coins after ceasing in 1959. And since the 2000 Jubilee, new gold coins have been issued annually. This week, children around the world joined together to pray the rosary to change the world. On the 18th, Aid to the Church in Need encouraged children to fulfill the words of St. Padre Pio. If one million children pray the rosary, the world will change. To encourage the initiative, ACN distributed 600,000 copies of their book, We Children Pray the Rosary, which is translated in eight languages. According to St. Pio, the rosary is the weapon for these times. Coming up next, tens of thousands visit the Vatican website each day, but how did the Vatican first get online? Well, we'll go up close with Sister Judith Zobelin, one of the pioneers of the Vatican Internet, to find out more. And we'll speak to the postulator of the newly canonized St. Elizabeth of the Trinity to find out what exactly goes on in the long, meticulous process of every canonization. We'll celebrate faith with the beloved St. Teresa of Avila and find out how her feast was celebrated near and far. And we'll take a look back on the Feast of St. Ignatius of Antioch. Media is powerful. It can change a culture. It can change a whole generation. It can impact the entire globe. Two years ago, Shalom World TV was a dream. Today, it's a reality. A commercial-free, high-definition television network broadcasting from the United States of America, reaching 375 million English-speaking people around the globe. We want to reach to the ends of the earth. Throughout the year, Shalom missionaries work day and night to accomplish this mission, to produce programs that evangelize the culture. What is wrong with Hunter's Tonight on 
seekers. I can make time for you. For divine knowledge. We want to continue this mission. We want to produce more programs to impact this generation positively. Will you be with us? Can you take a commitment of donating just $25 a month for the next 12 months? We assure you of our prayers. Visit shalomworld.org slash donate today. We thank you for your generosity. More headline news. In the United States, it's baseball season and the World Series is just around the corner. And while Americans enjoy their favorite pastime, we spoke to a priest who's helping to bring God to center field. Father Chris Comerford of the Diocese of Springfield in Illinois is co-chaplain for the St. Louis Cardinals. He spoke to Voice of the Vatican about the ministry. Every time the team's at home, we have that opportunity of a mass. So this is for um, from players to umpires to coaches uh, to the front office personnel, all the way down to stadium ushers and managers and anyone who works for the organization has that opportunity then to come to Mass. And one of the other opportunities I've had is to be with a team in their training in the spring, spring training as we call it, uh, in, in Florida in March. It's a great to be able to go away from the Midwest down to Southern Florida in uh, March and to be with the team. It's more casual, more laid back, so I can walk around even out on the fields when they're practicing and get a chance to talk to the players and the, the coaches and from the position and celebrate Mass uh, down in the complex uh, even at that time. And that's where I've extended when they're, they're so busy when they're here during the regular season, but before it gets started, it's a great time to get to know them and to uh, establish those relationships a little bit better. In college, Father Comerford studied communications, desiring to one day be a sports broadcaster. Then he heard God's call to the priesthood. One of the things that's always been in my life is that I always kind of wondered, was it sports or God that was the highest in my life? And uh, it was a challenge for me that sometimes maybe sports got up a little bit higher. But as I, I felt that call of God in my life, I, it definitely was incredible that I love God you know, with all my heart. I love the church. But also in being able to be part of sports, I can fulfill that passion also and to bring the same passion and love for God, the same passion and love I have for sports and to bring them together. And I think that's what God is calling us to do, whatever we have in life, to have that passion for what we are doing, knowing that he is the author of it all. Sports are such a, a great way of, of using our body in the way that God intended to exercise that, but also that great spirit of camaraderie and teamwork that can happen and uh, to be able to uh, bring our faith into everything that we do, as we're told. That's, you know, the method of living our faith and everything. So sports can connect very well. Uh, the group that I'm involved with, I'm wearing the, the cap from that, is Catholic Athletes for Christ. It's a national organization that was established to support those who want to live out their Catholic faith in the world of professional sports. It was started by a man named Ray McKenna from Washington, D.C., and he coordinates with the teams to be able to have a Catholic chaplain to offer the opportunity, especially with uh, Major League Baseball and with uh, the National Football League. Have that sense of doing everything for the glory of God, and even that's way of, of whether it's hitting a baseball or kicking a, a soccer ball or other ways that it still can be for the glory of God and that they can be those witnesses. Those, the athletes are looked highly upon, you know, by in society. If an athlete can stand up and say, my Catholic faith is important to me, it means the world to the young students in the grade schools and the high schools and others. And I've seen that impact in a great way that, wow, their, their faith is important to them. Maybe my faith should be important to me too. of thousands visit the Vatican website each day. But how did the Vatican first get online? Voice of the Vatican spoke to Sister Judith Zobelin, a pioneer of the Vatican internet, about how it all began. And I was putting in local area networks, I was doing training for some of the, the, the people, I was working on different programs. And then, it was the early 90s, so the internet was just beginning to emerge and flourish. So there were a few of us that were playing around with emails and, you know, looking at some of the internet sites that existed, which there weren't that many. And the people who I was working with, were like the Sala Stampa and uh, Vatican Information Services, they were very interested in it, and we were too. And it was basically on a interest, curiosity level. Then we started to talk about it and said, well, wouldn't it be neat if, we, if the Vatican did something like that? And 
because at that point it was Pope John Paul who was enormously popular and very human, someone very approachable that people really wanted to know more about. So we said, okay, well, let's give it a try. Fortunately, we had Joaquin Navarro Valls was also very much in favor of it and very much promoting it. And he had direct access with John Paul. So when he was able to go up to Pope John Paul and say, you know, we have this idea, this is what it's about. And and, um, it's not as that Pope John Paul understood technology. He had vision beyond that. He saw that the church needs to be out and needs to be something that can be a source to people that can be you know, in their, their living rooms, if you will, or be something that people can refer to. And so he immediately said yes, do it. The entrance into the information superhighway came at Christmas 1995 with a photo of Pope John Paul II along with the text of his Orbi at Orbi address. And then we had also opened um, uh, an email for the, the Holy Father, which we had also did not realize what that would mean. And we got thousands of emails, which doesn't sound like much now, but back then it was an enormous amount. Uh, Right after we we put that page up, the Holy Father over New Year's got sick with the flu. So that became the news. So we got a flood of emails of chicken soup recipes. And this is what my grandmother says. And this is, we're hoping we're praying for you. With the emails, all of a sudden he became somebody they knew. So we got emails saying like, you know, my sister's divorced and I don't know what to do. She's leaving the faith because of that. Or I have cancer and I'm dying. Could you pray for me? And he would take some of the emails and he, would, he had um, a pre that he was hollow inside. And when he would get prayers requests, he would take it and put it in the pre and pray on it that day. So he was taking a lot of these emails and putting it in there and praying over these people. He became virtually someone who was part of the family, part of the neighborhood. And... Um, I think it was a very, very good move for the church to really see how much people were interested in what the Pope had to say. You can check out the Vatican website at www.vatican.va. October 15th was the Feast of the Great Mystic, St. Teresa of Avila. And in Rome, annually, the faithful make pilgrimage to the Church of Santa Maria della Scala, to venerate the holy relic of the foot of St. Teresa, as well as to the Church of Santa Maria della Vittoria to admire John Lorenzo Bernini's exquisite Baroque sculpture, St. Teresa in Ecstasy, depicting the swooning nun and an angel with an arrow poised to pierce her heart with God's love. Meanwhile, in Bari, in Puglia, Italy, locals donned 16th century garb and hosted an historical parade. And in her home of Avila, Spain, celebrations began with a solemn mass at the cathedral, followed by a proclamation from the balcony of City Hall. Giant floats roamed the streets and a grand procession carried a statue of the saint high. In Avila, the week leading up to the feast was peppered with concerts, fireworks, and sports activities. And even a brave matador took the ring in a traditional bullfight. Before her death in 1582, St. Teresa, along with St. John of the Cross, reformed the Carmelites and founded the Discalced Carmelites. In 1970, she was declared a doctor of the church for her mystical writings and teachings on prayer. She is one of four women to be honored in this way. In this year of mercy, we remember her words, accustom yourself continually to make many acts of love for they enkindle and melt the soul. As the world is celebrating the canonization of its seven new saints, many are wondering what goes on behind the scenes to declare someone a saint. Voice of the Vatican spoke to Father Romano Gambalunga, the postulator of the cause of the newly canonized St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, for more. With the approval of the local bishop, the process opens in the diocese where the person died. Evidence is gathered through testimonials, writings of the person, and books to prove that he or she lived a virtuous life. An historical board and theologians evaluate the evidence. Then the evidence goes to Rome, where it's reviewed in respect to canonical norms. The postulator then presents the positio, which is the collection of the testimonials and documents. It's examined by a board of historians, theologians, bishops, and cardinals. 
If it is approved by the congregation of the causes of saints, it will be delivered to the Pope who will evaluate it, sign it, and acknowledge that this person has truly lived his Christian life in a heroic manner. When all these heroic virtues have been acknowledged, the person is given the title of first servant of God, then venerable. Then, in order to obtain the next step, beatification, a miracle is necessary, and in the majority of the cases, it's a miraculous healing. This requires the testimony of doctors and nurses and all the medical documentation, which is then evaluated by seven doctors. If the doctors are not able to explain it, if it's a rapid and complete healing, and deemed impossible according to medical explanations, and acknowledged that it happened because of the intervention of God, and that God intervened because of the prayers and the intercession of this person, then it goes to the bishops and cardinals on the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, who evaluate the theological aspect. If approved, the person can be beatified. For the canonization, another miracle is needed. This process could last from a minimum of 20 years to a maximum of 400 years. In the case of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, a woman was miraculously healed of the rare disease Sjogren, which causes the cessation of the function of the salivary glands. We have around 45 Carmelite blesseds, around 30 venerables, and another 35 or 40 servants of God. There are about 20 causes that are moving. One of the most popular causes is the cause of Lucia of Fatima. It's in the diocesan phase, which has been really slow because of its complexity. But now we are near to the conclusion of this phase. It was here in Rome that St. Ignatius of Antioch was martyred for his faith, devoured by lions in the Colosseum in the early 2nd century. St. Ignatius was an early church father, a disciple of St. John the Apostle, and the third bishop of Antioch. En route to Rome to meet his martyrdom, he wrote a series of letters which have been preserved as an example of very early Christian theology. Important topics addressed in these letters include the sacraments, the role of bishops, as well as a very clear teaching on the real presence of the true flesh and blood of Christ in the Eucharist. When referring to the authority of the Church, he coined the phrase Catholic Church, still in use to this day. He's the patron of the churches in the Eastern Mediterranean and in North Africa. And on his feast day of October 17th, many pilgrims venerated his remains in the Church of San Clemente here in Rome. All week, you can keep up with the latest happenings in Rome on our Twitter feed, which is at Voice of Vatican. And be sure to like us on Facebook on our Voice of the Vatican page. Keep checking our social media feeds for breaking news and information about upcoming guests and features. And we want to hear your voice too. Email your questions to us at vov at shalomworld.org. I'm Ashley Nerona, and on behalf of the entire staff and crew of Voice of the Vatican, I wish you a blessed week and feast of Pope St. John Paul II. Saying ciao for now from the Eternal City, I'll see you right here next week for Voice of the Vatican only on Shalom World TV, bringing Rome to your home.